Thanks for having me here. So uh, I was kind of asked to fill in last minute uh, for a speaker who kind of got sick, and uh, so I needed to present something sort of near and dear to my heart, something that I could do quickly without too much preparation. Uh, so I give you uh, a presentation. Uh, you know, the, con the organizers didn't ask exactly what I was going to present on, so uh, woodworking basics. Deploying dovetails to production, specifically handmade ones. Very difficult. Uh, I'm just kidding. JavaScript. Of course, right? You knew that. Uh, so JavaScript, what's now, what's coming now, and uh, what's coming next? Uh, I'll go over a bit of history uh, of TC39. Um, but the uh, big thing that I want you to take away from this is some excitement about where JavaScript, the language, is going. And um, I have a lot of links in here for where you can get involved uh, with the community and uh, even help um, design the language and uh, provide feedback and all that kind of stuff. So really be watching for things that you are uh, interested by. And definitely uh, feel free to uh, participate. So I get asked a lot, what, what actually is TC39? Well, it's, it's kind of obvious. It's the 39th Technical Committee in, in ECMA. Uh, but that's kind of a, a tautological definition. Um, but it's really just people. It's just a bunch of people in a room hashing things out. Um, there's a bunch of member organizations. Uh, many of them have uh, employees here today. Uh, there's also academia. Um, uh, there's a bunch of people that are working on uh, sort of the more theoretical side of, of language, like building reference implementations that are provably correct and that kind of thing. Uh, and there's also community projects and uh, invited experts and uh, other individuals that uh, contribute a lot to uh, what TC39 is. So with that out of the way, I'm not going to use the clicker. Here's a 3,048-meter view of TC39's work. Uh, that's 10,000 feet for those of you who don't speak uh, Imperial units. Uh, there's ECMA 262. That's um, the ECMAScript standard. Uh, there's also ECMA 402, which is uh, the separate internationalization standard. This is the Intel object that you might be using if you're uh, localizing your applications. Uh, and there's also ECMA 404 spec not found. That's the uh, JSON format. That's also a separate spec. TC39 uh, owns all of this work. Um, so in order for you to appreciate just how awesome uh, uh, our process and, and stuff is today, I really have to tell you uh, a little bit of history. So like Ashley mentioned, JavaScript was actually born in 10 days um, under like severe management pressure. Brennan Ike did an amazing thing, and uh, JavaScript was born. Of course, 1.0 was missing a bunch of stuff. Like it uh, didn't even have prototypical inheritance at the time. Uh, but regardless, it was born. And then a few years later, in uh, June of 97, we got edition one. Um, and then we had this kind of really nice, uh, I say we, but I actually was not. I was still in high school at this time, I guess. Um, but uh, edition two and edition three followed very rapidly. Um, so in uh, 1999, uh, the third edition of ECMAScript came out. That's like roughly the IE6 era, uh, to give you an idea of what that was. So just you know what we would consider today really basic JavaScript. Some of us target this uh, version of the language in our transpilers, uh, and that code is, is really bad. But regardless, after uh, 99, we sort of entered this huge span of time where nothing happened. Uh, the committee was working on this ECMAScript 4 thing, and there was a bunch of different ideas, and like there was proposals for even types, like static types were in there. Um, for a while, it looked like um, ActionScript was going to actually become uh, the standard ECMAScript. Uh, but ultimately, it didn't work out. And so after a decade of work, in December of 2009, we got ES5. And that really didn't add much. That added strict mode. That added getters and setters, JSON, and some of the object reflection uh, capabilities. Uh, so it, it introduced the notion of a property descriptor and that kind of thing. Um, so it took 10 years for that, kind of frustrating. And then it was another six years before we got the next version of the spec, uh, ES5, or ES6, or otherwise known as uh, ES2015. 
Um, yes, there's an off by one error there, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but uh, this finally, 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 we got a big, big update to the language. The reason this update was so big is because th it was actually the culmination of all of that work during the ES4 period that never came to fruition. A bunch of that stuff was brought back, uh, and, and actually we got consensus to get th that into the language. Uh, so ES6 added promises, classes, uh, iterators and generators and their associated protocols, the typed arrays, uh, maps and sets. Um, it added a new syntax for functions, the arrow functions, uh, proxies, which are really cool, and a bunch of other uh, really handy syntax sugar and capabilities and library enhancements and that kind of thing. Uh, so 15 years, roughly, um, we finally got a major update to the language. Now, ES2016 was released very rapidly after that. And that's because at the time, we, after ES6 uh, ES, uh, or uh, ES2015 came out, we uh, realized that the current process just wasn't going to scale. Uh, TC39 was growing very large. They had a lot of stakeholders. And um, we also really wanted to, to uh, sort of democratize the spec, to make, uh, make it open to everyone to, to read and uh, contribute. And so uh, part of that was uh, moving away from this Word document that we'd been keeping the spec in since 1.0. It's actually really interesting to note that it was the same Word document from 97. So that's really an impressive, um, I think, testament to uh, software compatibility. Um, but that's about the only good thing about it. Uh, so uh, now the spec is in HTML. It's an HTML and Markdown sort of uh, dialect. It's plain text. You can read it and write it in uh, pretty much any editor. Um, but this release is tiny. We, we only had a year to work on it, and we also didn't have uh, much stuff in the pipeline. So this added the exponentiation operator, uh, which is uh, star star to do math.pal, and array.prototype.includes. Not very impressive. That release was all about the new process. By the next year for ES2017, the pipeline was starting to fill up. We finally got async functions in, and uh, also shared memory and atomics, which finally enabled uh, truly performant cross-thread um, uh, applications to be written on the web platform, and uh, object.values and entries. Uh, so again, a fairly small release. The pipeline is uh, still filling up. Uh, I would say now we have uh, a pretty full pipeline. There's a bunch of proposals that are in the, in the pipeline. And uh, so now the question is, what's next? Now what? Well, what do you think? It's kind of up to you to help us figure that out. Do you want to help? I hope so. There's a bunch of ways to participate in um, Equascript. Uh, of course, you know we're all on Twitter, and we're all trying to be um, uh, uh, keeping in touch with uh, the developer community. Um, but these are, I think, the primary ways to get involved. Um, so GitHub, this GitHub site, literally everything that TC39 does as far as standards work occurs on GitHub. So you can pretty much get a complete picture of where TC39 is on any feature just by going to this GitHub site and finding the, the proposal that you're interested in. There's also a mailing list. If you're not into like actually subscribing to mailing lists, which I think is the case for most of us, there's a website for it. Uh, and there's also an IRC channel. Um, I want to point out that we're kind of in the early days of figuring out how to integrate ourselves with the community. So if, if we're missing, uh, missing you where you are, and you think uh, we need to do a better job in reaching your community and understanding uh, your needs, uh, suggest something. Uh, we will uh, definitely uh, strongly consider um, uh, any improvements here. So we have a code of conduct. Just you know, be nice. Um, and uh, another interesting project that I want, really want to call out is uh, Test 262. This is the project that got me into ECMAScript. It was like six years ago. Um, there was this Test 262 thing. I was on the test team at Microsoft working on this new JavaScript engine called Chakra. And uh, I thought this was a really cool thing. It's like, hey, let a test suite owned by a standards committee that tells implementers how good their implementation is effectively, like how, how well it, it uh, conforms to the spec. Uh, so this is actually used by all JavaScript engines. Right now it has uh, over 50,000 tests, and it's growing every day. 
And uh, this is kind of a, a good way, I think, to sort of um, train yourself on some of the skills that are uh, n uh, required to uh, work with TC39 on stuff. So you, like, you can't write tests unless you can do the spec reading and uh, a bunch of other uh, interesting stuff. So uh, Test262 is a great way uh, to get uh, involved. Uh, this is the big guy, uh, ECMA 262. This is um, the ECMAScript spec. Um, so uh, if you have uh, bugs that you know, you're reading the document and you find uh, something that seems off to you, you can file bugs there. Um, if you find typos uh, and other things, you can file bugs or just send a pull request. I, I vastly prefer that. Um, you know, it's one button press. It's real nice. Um, you can also discuss uh, changes, um, but this repo is is only for changes that aren't proposals. So this is like more scope changes to ECMA 262. Uh, ch uh, proposals that uh, are in the pipeline, where you know this is probably the stuff that you're mostly interested in. You can find that here at this link, uh, GitHub.com/tc39/proposals. This is our pipeline. This has every proposal that TC39 is aware of from the uh, low stage zero proposals all the way up to the completed uh, stage five proposals. In each of these proposals, you'll find spec text, you'll find issues where you can use, um, uh, where you will find discussions about the future, people sharing their concerns and working through design issues and that kind of stuff. And there will also be FAQs and use cases and a lot of other design documents and things. Early proposals won't have much of that, but you'll find that more in the later proposals. Uh, so it's a great uh, resource to read through it and, and sort of learn how, um, how this feature is supposed to work and what its use cases and intentions are. Um, briefly, I have to mention the, the staging process since you'll immediately get exposed to this. Um, stage zero, just basically any proposal that a TC39 delegate dreams up, um, that's a valid stage zero proposal. The only requirement is there has to be a delegate champion. Uh, stage one is uh, TC39 saying, yep, seems like a problem. Go ahead and spend some time figuring it out. At stage two is when you start to get some initial spec text. And here, uh, TC39 is saying, yes, we think that this proposal uh, or something like it uh, will likely be included in a future edition of the standard. Um, so you notice up until this point, the, the, the proposals are really loose. There's a lot of room for change. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're uh, trying to use these stage zero, one, and two proposals in tools like Babel. Stage three is where things start to really get solid. Uh, there's complete spec text, and the committee is essentially saying, OK, we think the spec text is good. Now we need to, know, we need to know if you can actually implement it. So implementers go out, do your work, give us feedback, and uh, we'll take that into consideration. Uh, and assuming everything is good, then we get to stage four, which is um, at that point, it's uh, my job to move that uh, proposal into the uh, main spec text, and then it's basically on the train and will be released in the next version that comes out a year uh, later. So I want to talk about some of these proposals because these are there's a lot of really exciting work happening, and I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of great opportunities for you folks to get involved. Um, just to give you an idea of the scope of the number of proposals that we have, this is actually an old. Uh, list. I haven't, I haven't updated this in a while. Um, there are a lot of proposals. This doesn't even include the stage zero proposals, of which there are a bunch more. Um, so like, if you're into JavaScript, there's definitely something here that uh, you'll be interested in. A lot of this stuff has been covered in the in-depth track and some of the other uh, talks, but I just want to cover it briefly. Uh, classes are getting um, a new version. Um, the, the version of classes that were in ES6 uh, were something that we called maximally minimal. Uh, maximally minimal just means the most useful thing that we can do and also get consensus on that thing. So you know, you, when you're trying to get a bunch of people to agree on something, the less you're trying to agree on, the easier the process is going to be. And so classes, we always knew that, uh, well, we're going to come back and add a bunch of features to classes that people have been asking for. Uh, and that's what this is all about. So decorators, for people that are um, familiar with decorators in other languages, these work pretty much the same um, in, in terms of uh, you know, what they can do. Um, it's a little bit more JavaScript-y, uh, but 
Um, still, uh, it's sort of the same deal of uh, declaratively altering the, the shapes and behaviors of uh, objects and classes. Uh, public field declarations, probably most people in this room are using public field declarations already in tools like Babel um, but, uh, and, and, and TypeScript. It, they've been uh, supported in those tools for uh, quite some time. Um, really, really handy. Um, and also private field declarations and methods are coming. So finally, we can have private in JavaScript. And this is actually true private. Um, there's no reflection. It's not like symbols where you can use git own um, symbols or I uh, forgot the, uh, the name of that API. But you can't, uh, unless you're inside of the class, you have no idea that these private slots even exist, uh, let alone be able to access them. Uh, so that's something that library authors and framework authors have really been asking to because uh, you folks are really bad at avoiding uh, underscore properties. Which I understand. I understand. You you just gotta get your work done. So uh, I I love regex. I have a lot of fun doing regex. Um, based on uh, some of the previous times I've talked about this, there's a number of you who don't write regex. Um, you know, a lot of people end up being like sort of the regex guru on their team. Um, uh, but regardless, uh, hopefully this isn't too. Uh, uh, hard to read. Um, so look behinds uh, are a feature that have been in pretty much every JavaScript, or not JavaScript, uh, pretty much every regex engine. Um, but um, JavaScript uh, regexes, for some reason, only had uh, look ahead. I heard an interesting technique, actually, for solving that problem. If you reverse the string and use a look ahead. Um, <laughs> I, hadn't, I have, actually haven't seen that one yet, but it's, it's kind of awesome. Uh, but it'd be nice not to have to do that. Uh, there's also going to be Unicode property escapes. This is a way to match characters based on how Unicode classifies them. So you can uh, match, uh, for example, white space to match the however many hundred white space characters exist in Unicode, or numbers. Uh, there's not just 10 numbers. Uh, there are many, many, many numbers. Uh, bold ones, ones in Gothic, outline ones. Uh, so you can actually write uh, regex to match those. Uh, named capture groups. Uh, is another feature that other, uh, most other regex engines have. Uh, this lets you name a capture group. And then when you actually do the match, uh, you have a, a dot groups op uh, object. And you can just reference these capture groups by name. Uh, one of the aspects about this that I really like is that it helps you actually document what that capture group is. I actually kind of see this as half a capability that's kind of nice and half giving you the capability to actually document your regex in a way that uh, makes it a little bit more understandable. Uh, and then there's the uh, dot all flag. How many people know that dot doesn't match everything in JavaScript? If you try to do a dot, it doesn't. It doesn't match line breaks, even with the uh, 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 multi-line mode. It matches everything but. So there's cool tricks, like square bracket, um, a caret close square bracket, or um, uh, a character class with um, backslash D, backslash capital D, or something like that. Um, those all are bad. Uh, the S flag, I think, uh, is going to be something that you're going to want to set on pretty much every uh, regex that you use uh, in the future, along with the Unicode flag, which uh, was added um, recently. Of course, nothing uh, is nicer than syntax sugar. We all love it. It doesn't add any new capabilities to the language, but it does let us express our intent in a lot more uh, clear way. Uh, and just makes programming more fun, I think. Uh, rest and spread for properties is something, again, that is uh, a heavily used pattern in the uh, React community that's coming. Also, optional catch parameter. Um, very simple proposal. It just lets you leave off the binding for the error. Um, uh, a lot, I think this proposal is, um, has the the highest ratio of um, concerns to spec text of any proposal. Um, but uh, I, I personally hope to see it. Um, numeric separators are uh, coming. Um, this is going to be especially uh, important with um, the uh, big integers that are coming. Um, but um, it'll be nice for uh, uh, JavaScript, uh, uh, just regular floats as well. 
Uh, and then there's also optional chaining. This is another pretty popular um, uh, s extension in the, in the Babel world. Um, uh, it basically lets you dot off of an object and not care if that object is actually there or not. You'll just get undefined or something. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty handy uh, feature for a pattern that we do a lot. Big integers are coming. Finally, a number type other than floats. Um, so big integers, arbitrary size. You can uh, store numbers up to the um, how much RAM you have on your machine. So uh, you really, you can, um, uh, you know, it'll be slow, but uh, you, can, you can have a really, really, really big number. Um, so there's no, uh, uh, there's no sort of weird floating point behavior with these things. Um, I once implemented an accounting system using a uh, floating point number of dollars, and the accountants were very upset with me because pennies would go missing just like into the ether, and like I had no idea what was going on. Uh, if I had big integers, that might have not been a problem because um, you don't get this loss of precision. It's just integer arithmetic, and um, you avoid a lot of the, the troubles of uh, floating points. Um, so there's not a lot of um, operator overloading here. They're kind of throwy um, in that a lot of the normal uses you might think of will end up uh, uh, throwing. Like you can't add a, a big integer and a float because we don't really know what that means. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. But uh, that's something that we can work on uh, improving in the future. Here's another proposal that I'm really excited about, the pipeline operator. This lets you do functional chaining. It's basically a way to um, do nested functions, but stack them one after the other after the other. It's just basically nested functions. Um, so you can think of it like passing the left-hand side as an argument to the right-hand side. Um, I, I want to. I, so this is an early proposal. So this is basically just my thinking about it. Just keep that in mind. But uh, you know, you can pass in um, the left-hand side as the first parameter, or potentially there's a question mark placeholder, uh, which would let you use um, like Ramda.js, which takes its um, data as the last parameter. Uh, and I think that's a kind of nice syntax to sort of customize where you're going to pass the the left-hand side's uh, value into. Uh, it has a really nice benefit that it works out of the box with a lot of libraries in the ecosystem. So, and there's more coming every day that, that um, make this a really uh, great language feature to have. So there's, like, you saw that list. There's a ton more. Here's a couple that I'm excited about. Do expressions let you put statements and expression forms when you need it, you really need it. Um, uh, also, uh, dates. Uh, raise your hand if you really like JavaScript dates. There are no hands. There are no hands. I have never once seen a hand actually go up to that question. Uh, so uh, Maggie Pint, uh, she works on the uh, Moment JS team. She is uh, working with TC39 to develop a new date that actually works. <laughs> yes. And it's going to be amazing, actually. Uh, I cannot wait for this. Uh, throw expressions are coming, so you can throw in your um, uh, parameter initializers. Um, maybe I want to return break and continue uh, expressions as well. I don't know. What do you think? Um, uh, also, flat map and flatten uh, are a couple proposals that I'm working on that I personally use uh, all the time. And man, there are just a ton more proposals. So definitely go check it out. and. Uh, see uh, where you can get involved. So here's a few links, um, uh, TC39 uh, GitHub page and the proposals. Um, you, know, you can uh, follow uh, the development of ECMAScript itself. If you're not interested in these proposals, you just want to see like, what's in the spec right now. Um, so I hope to see you out there. And thank you. Thank you.